Okay. So for this week, oh, is somebody trying to speak here? Okay. No, that was the uh, the computer saying that. Okay. So for this week, we have one chapter left. That's chapter 16. It's one of my favorites. It's polymer chemistry, which is what I've done a lot of my career on. I've probably been working with polymer chemistry for uh, 30 years. <laughs> Don't read anything into that. But anyway, uh, so uh, for uh, today, homework 15 is due tonight at midnight. And homework 16 isn't due until Monday, November 30th. Don't forget, that's also the day we're going to have our um, <clears throat> review and get ready for our exam on, let's see, our exam is on December 2nd. We have a review on the, uh, um, the 30th. So, uh, and the exam on the December 2nd is going to be focusing on chapters 12 through 16. So it's just going to be those four chapters. And then the final will be comprehensive. And that'll be held at our normal final hour time, which is 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. on December 9th. Uh, so write that down if you don't already have it. This is also on Canvas, so you can always check there too. So are there any questions about what's going to be due this week while we're doing this? Obviously, the only thing left in lab is going to be our final, uh, our final quiz, and that will be on the week of November 30th as well. So I'll send an email out and a review on that uh, today, and so you can get kind of started on that. Uh, email review, yeah, it's on my list already. Excellent, so I'll be able to do that. Um, are there any questions? Go ahead and use the chat or try to unmute and I will go ahead and start sharing my screen for our last little chapter, chapter 16. Okay, so this is actually a really cool uh, in capper chapter because what it does is it uses a lot of the different chemistries we've looked at so far to build these molecules that are different than what we've been studying up to now. Up to now, we've been looking at these individual small molecules, and most of the time when we see them change, you know, they'll change color or go from a liquid to a solid or a solid to a liquid and stuff like that. And so it's, it's not as tangible as polymer chemistry. Polymer chemistry literally goes to the point where you can take a gas and turn it into a hard material that can be molded again and again and again. That's the magic of polymer chemistry. So let me talk to you about it and kind of lay out the concept right here. So <clears throat> the idea is a polymer is any long chain molecule linked together with single parts. And those single parts are called monomers. Imagine you have two people and they are each individuals and then they start holding hands. Well, that makes them, you know, a link. Obviously don't do that now in COVID. We'll, we'll wait until next summer to do this. But then if you had a hundred people and, you, and they all held hands, that would create a polymer chain of people. There's a poly meaning many, Mer meaning units, okay? So polymer is many, many units added together. And in polymer chemistry, most of the time, if it's synthetic polymer chemistry, we're looking at fairly small units. However, <clears throat> if you take the following course for biochemistry, there's also a whole set of biopolymers, which are, you know, they are DNA, RNA, proteins, uh, a lot of the lipids are these very long chain polymers as well. So, uh, but those are mostly naturally occurring. What the polymers I'm gonna to talk to you about are the more synthetically viable versions that are done industrially to make all sorts of the plastics and stuff around us. Okay, so poly meaning many, mer meaning unit. So that means a mono meaning one, mer is one unit. So that's the simplest thing we can break it down to. And then as we build, as we add two together, we would call that a dimer for two, trimer, tetramer, pentamer, blah, 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 until we have too many to count. And when we have too many to count, we call it a polymer. The other common name for this is what we call plastics, okay? So plastic is a broad term, meaning synthetic polymer, uh, but it actually has a more uh, precise definition. And within the precise definition, there's two types. There's what we call a thermoplastic. And a thermoplastic is something that can be melted, 
squished into a mold or turned into some other shape like a fiber. And then when it cools, it, it solidifies and it has certain properties when it does that. But then you can take that, remelt it and do it again. So a thermoplastic is a polymer that you can melt, form, melt, form, melt, form, melt, form. Okay. So in theory, things like the polyethylene terephthalate bottles can be done that multiple times. Okay. Uh, but there is a slight loss in properties as you do it. So that's why little polyethylene terephthalate bottles, which we'll show the chemical structure later, are actually usually converted into something of a lower quality, like a carpet. And so they, they don't have to have as much mechanical strength. And so we'll see that, you know, we have these high-end uses of polymers and then these additional uses of polymers. And most of those are thermoplastics right there. Can be heated, molded, and heated again. The next time was what we call a thermoset. Okay, thermosets tend to be more brittle. And once you heat them and, 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 and uh, mold them, they cannot be remelted and they cannot be dissolved. So we have a thermoplastic, which can be reused. And we have a thermoset, which cannot be reused. So you have to think of those as two different modes in which we can have those polymers form. Okay. So Whenever we have naming of a polymer, most of the time what we are doing is we're taking a small molecule that we made it out of and then add poly to the front of it, okay? Now, instead of using the IUPAC names, most of the names we use are the common names. So if we made, an, if we made a polymer of acetone, it'd be called polyacetone because that is the common name. So for example, this right here, we would call this uh, uh, propylene, but the, um, and, and then so we can say, okay, that's just one of them. But if we polymerize this, turned into a very long chain, we would call it polypropylene. Now notice when I blow this up here, we have two different colors of lines here, okay? Now on the first color line, we have the red one, and I'm gonna highlight it here, right here. And that correlates to, the three carbons and the bonds associated with the monomer. Now we have a second line here, okay? And that's this darker line here. And then it's next to another right here. So what this is saying is that these red bonds were in the monomer and these new black bonds right here are what we used, oops, to create the polymer. So we use the double bond in this polypropylene to create this new sigma bond, new sigma bond, new sigma bond. And that's how we make polymers, okay? And so because we don't wanna take up a whole bunch of space by just drawing all the different repeat units, cause it can be hundreds, maybe even thousands of units long, sometimes millions of units long. We actually don't wanna say, well, we have exactly 17 units. So we just use the little denote N here saying that there are an unknown number of that repeat unit in this polymer, okay? So the N is our average degree of polymerization. And since no, we don't have perfect polymer chains, they're not all 100, they're you know, gonna be a, a range of you know, 50 to 150, but the average would be 100. And so that would we would call our average degree of polymerization. And it makes it easier to write the polymers. We put brackets around the repeat unit and put the little N there. And that tells us we have a polymer system consisting of the units that are inside that bracket. And we're gonna show that same terminology as we go through the rest of the polymer systems we're talking about. Okay. So <clears throat> like I said before, we would take any kind of compound and if it's made out of that one thing, we would call it that thing plus putting poly in front of it. Most of the time we use the engineering common name. For example, right here, we would call this probably uh, vinyl uh, benzene right here, or uh, benzene uh, ethylene, the phenylethylene as a IUPAC name, but the common engineering name is called styrene. So what we'll, when we name them, we name them for the polymer group and then the common engineering name. So that's polystyrene. This is most commonly used in those white foam coolers that are real squishy. That's puffed up polystyrene with the little uh, pockets of air into them to make them into a uh, foam, which makes them very insulating. Okay. 
Another very common one is what we use a vinyl chloride, or we'd call this chloroethylene, but the engineering name is vinyl chloride. So when we make a polymer out of it, it's called polyvinyl chloride, or short name PVC. So there's two really common uses for PVC. One of them is the uh, white pipes you see for water around the house. Those are made out of polyvinyl chloride and they are 100% polyvinyl chloride. There's nothing else in it. The other cool place we see these are on these flexible tubes that are, are used like beer kegs and stuff like that. Those flexible tubes are most of the time they're polyvinyl chloride as well, but they have added to them things that make them rubbery and plasticky. And we call those plasticizers. So that same polymer can do be very rigid and very hard or very pliable and very rubbery. So it's all about how you process the system. So the other cool thing is that you don't just have to make a straight chain out of these like we've seen so far. Most of these are straight chain. Any type of mistake in our system and we end up with a branched system like this. So if we think about polyethylene, which should just be you know, this going into just this as a repeat in here, very rarely is that ethylene clean enough and we usually get branches in there. And that gives it a different structure and different properties. Another one is where you have the branches coming off at a regular point, that's called a comb. If you have the comb attached to another linear chain, we get what we call a ladder polymer. And ladder polymers tend to be very rigid and have very strong physical properties. Then again, we can also go to a really fancy one where we start all the polymer in the middle and it grows out into a star shape. These are actually used in water purification and adding flocculate, it adds a, it latches a hold of things floating around in water and makes water clearer. We have cross-link polymer networks and that's kind of like those thermosets. Those are any very hard plastic that you see uh, Bakelite is one of them. Uh, let me think. Anything epoxy would be considered a cross-link polymer network. And then last is a very delicate structure. It has multiple branches with multiple branches with multiple branches. And these are used for uh, drug release because they can put big molecules inside this dendritic uh, structure. Then you swallow that dendritic structure and it slowly releases the molecule that's held in those little branches. And so we can use different polymers for different reasons. That's why I like it so much. That's why I go, always get excited about polymers. Okay, well, this morphology, you know, just because they can be straight or whatever, that's not the only thing that can happen. The other thing that can happen is if you have a chain and another chain, and now they're no longer in solution, that when they're melting, they can slip past each other. But then when they cool, they are starting to bond together. And if you have something like polyethylene, all we have is van der Waals forces, right? So that's a very weak interaction, okay? But what if we had things that can hydrogen bond to each other, like uh, an amide group or something like that? When they hydrogen bond to each other, that can make very structured, very rigid uh, connections in between the two polymer chains. And so that lends us to these ideas that we could have areas that are very controlled, very crystalline, very rigid, and we call those crystalline domains. And then we can have places where they're disordered, where they just kind of slip past each other in all different directions. And when they're slipping past each other in all different directions, then it's just very small interactions related to it, and they tend to be softer. And we call those amorphous domains, meaning non-crystalline or, or disordered. Okay, so we can take advantage of these two different domains because a lot of polymers can be made with either domain, depending on how you process it, okay? So if we want it to be highly crystalline, there's a couple different ways we can do that. The first way we can do that is to have things with strong intermolecular forces like hydrogen bonds. Like imagine you had a uh, polyamides or something with alcohols on there where they could grab onto each other and do hydrogen bonding. This is increases the crystallinity because those bonds are very strong intermolecular forces, okay? Whenever you have a whole bunch of these crystalline domains, they tend to scatter light. So uh, you may have heard the phrase crystal clear. That works great for things like glass, but in polymers, crystal clear means that it is completely amorphous because any little crystals inside a polymer scatters light and makes them opaque. 
So it's the, one of the weird opposite things about polymer chemistry. Okay, so if it's a highly amorphous polymer, if it's one that has very little crystalline domains because there's nothing to make you know these strong uh, interactions or these crystalline forms, they tend to be softer and they tend to have what we call a glass transition temperature. So a glass transition temperature is where you have this solid that's kind of holding together but doesn't have a lot of hydrogen bonding or something holding it together. And then once you hit it, you go above that where it starts to flow. And we get into what we call the, uh, the rubbery state. So you have the state where they're not flowing past each other, but they don't have strong bonds. You heat it up just enough so they start to flow past each other a little bit, and that's the rubbery state. So we go from a clear, harder polymer to a softer, clear, rubbery polymer. And it all takes place at temperatures. Every polymer has a different one of these. For example, silicone, like a silicone sealant, that glass transition temperature is minus 60 degrees C. So that means all the way through its, uh, you know, most of the household environment, it's in that soft rubbery state. But some things like um, hot melt glue, hot melt glue is in its hard glass state until you heat it through the hot melt glue and then it turns into its rubber state, then it goes back to its hard state. So that's a good example of using an everyday use of the glass transition temperature going from hard to rubbery back to hard. Okay, so I said that most polymers can make crystalline domains and amorphous domains. So how can we do that? So, well, so if we have crystalline domains, there has to be something that allows us to have order. But if we have non-crystalline domains, we have to have something that allows us to have disorder. So let's talk about this example here. This is polyethylene terephthalate. And if you look at the recycling symbol, it's P-E-T-E -E for polyethylene terephthalate ester, engineering term. But the chemical name is polyethylene terephthalate. And the chemical structure is something fairly simple. We learned about terephthalic acid in our carboxylic acids, I mean, in our benzene chapter here. And it's just the 1,4 dicarboxylic acid of benzene. And we take ethylene glycol, which is this 1,2 diol. So that's where the ethylene comes from. That's ethylene diol. And terephthalate is the diester of terephthalic acid. So if you notice here, the functional group here is the ester group right here, this is an ester. And then with this oxygen and this carbonyl over here, that's the other ester. So these can do a type of um, dipole-dipole interaction from polymer chain to polymer chain. So that means they can form crystalline domains, okay? But how do we control it till we have between 0% or 55%? That's all in the processing. The exact same polymer can be either way, depending on how you use it. Okay. If you take that melted PET and cool it down really quickly, it has no time for those crystals to form. It takes time to form crystals. You saw it in the lab where we form crystals in the, it took time to form those crystals. And so if it doesn't have enough time, you cool it below that glass transition point, then you have a very amorphous structure and it's crystal clear. You can see straight through it because there are no crystals for that. However, if you take that and cool it down to a, a furrow really slowly or pull it as you're cooling it, that allows those dipole-dipole interactions along the polymer chain. So as you get more of those dipole-dipole interactions, it gets stronger and stronger and more crystalline, and more crystalline. And those tend to be opaque white fibers. So the same polymer can be used to make it either crystalline or non-crystalline, depending on processing. So that's the that's one of the other cool things about uh, polymers. Okay. In this chapter, we are going to talk about two types of polymers. The first type we're going to talk about is what we call step growth polymers. That means we're going to take a chain and we're going to make functional groups out of them. So think about anything with a functional name, like amide or ester or carbonate or epoxy. Those are all step growth polymers because we're making a functional group when we do it. The other type is what we call chain growth, and I'll show you that later. 
but we don't change the functional group in that. Here we're changing the functional groups, okay? And typically we have to have two different functional groups, either on the same monomer or two different monomers, like one that's carboxylic acids and one that's an alcohol, one that's an amide, amine, one that's a carboxylic acid. We have to have two different functional groups to make these things grow step by step, okay? So the first one we're gonna talk about is the polyamide. Because as we know, the polyamide is one of those uh, functional groups of carboxylic acids that is the least reactive with things. It's the hardest to get to, it's the hardest to get uh, to substitute. You can't make an ester out of it. It is one of those more stable carboxylic acid derivatives. So that's why we will make a lot of polymers out of this amide functionality. So <clears throat> one of the ones we can do is what we call nylon 6-6. Nylon 6-6 is usually made into fibers. You can do carpet and you can do clothes with it, okay? Let me tell you why they call it 6-6, okay? If we look at just the carboxylic acid here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons, including those carboxylic acid carbons, okay? Let's look at the other monomer. In this amine, we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. So nylon 6-6 six, six gets the idea that six of the carbons from, come from the carboxylic acid or the hexadioic acid, and six of the carbons come from the hexane diamine, the other monomer, okay? So that's why 6-6 six, six gets a name, okay? And it's made by a cool process where they take the two things together and just by adding them together, the carboxylic acid acts as an acid the amine acts as a base and the reaction stops. They just form salts, okay? But if you tend to take that salt and heat it up so you can drive off water, what you're gonna do is you're gonna eliminate water and create your amide, okay? And so it takes heat and pressure to do this and you end up with our amide functionality. Now, the great thing about our amide functionality is we now have a hydrogen bondable hydrogen and a hydrogen bondable carbonyl group. So that means we can make very crystalline polymers out of nylon because of that hydrogen bonding is one of our strongest intermolecular forces. Okay, so let's look at that. Well, you know, how, how does this work? Well, we look at one chain, well, this is just one chain we're looking at here, and it's got this oxygen that can hydrogen bond to an acidic hydrogen. And if it bonds to an acidic hydrogen on a neighboring chain, that means it's gonna be perfectly spaced out to hydrogen bond on another position on the same chain and perfectly spaced to make another hydrogen bond on the same chain. So by having them perfectly spaced out to do the hydrogen bonding, you know that every six carbons, you're gonna have a hydrogen bond, making it stronger, make, increasing its uh, crystallinity, and increasing its strength and stiffness, okay? So that is where nylon gets its thing. By drawing these out, by pulling them, and getting all those little hydrogen bonds to align makes them very, very strong. Okay, so uh, they make nylon 6-6 six, six out of uh, petrochemical products. The dicarboxylic acid is made from the oxidation of benzene. For, oh, I'm sorry, we first reduce the benzene to give us the cyclohexane. Then we oxidize it to a cyclohexane diol. And then we use that weird reaction where we use nitric acid and that clips this off and oxidizes it to give us six carbons with two carboxylic acids, okay? So this is, uh, you know, using stuff from chapters, you know, eight, nine, and 10 to show you the, that reaction. Then the cool thing is that you can take this and make your diamine out of that. And the way we make the diamine is we just take that carboxylic acid and add ammonia to it. And it makes that salt we saw last time in the polymerization. And then when we heat it up, it makes a primary amide. And by reducing down our carbonyls, we get to six carbons with our diamine. So they make both monomers from benzene, they make both monomers from that dicarboxylic acid. So it's really efficient to do this industrially because 
You're using the same materials over and over again. Okay, now in comparison, there's another one called nylon six, okay? So if nylon six, six was the idea that we had six carbons in the carboxylic acid and six carbons in the, in the diamine, where did the other six carbons go? Well, instead of using a dicarboxylic acid and a diamine, what we're gonna use is we're gonna use a cyclic amide. Remember, those are called lactams. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna open that up and turn it into a polymer chain, okay? Now notice this is a seven-membered ring. And what do we know about seven-membered rings, right? They're not really favored. We would rather have six-membered rings and five-membered rings. Four-membered rings get strained and seven-members ring are, have too much disorder, so they don't like them. So the driving force for this is by being able to basically partially hydrolyze this bond, you can extend that chain out and turn it into a long chain. Now notice we have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons between the carbonyl and the nitrogen, and therefore it's nylon six. Okay. And this has some of the same properties that the other nylon has, it's just made from a different monomer. Questions on nylons. Carboxylic acid amine makes an amide. Those amides can hydrogen bond to in between chains that give them their strength. That's the key thing in amides, polyamides. All right. So there's another derivative of this. If we take out those aliphatic chains, those little, you know, hexanes parts, and replace them with benzene rings. Now we're going to add a whole bunch of rigidity to the system. And we call this an aromatic amide or an aramid, okay? Kevlar, bulletproof vests. They also use them for uh, 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 firefighters' coats, flame-resistant coats, and stuff like that. It's really strong because, number one, it has the hydrogen bonding. It's regularly spaced with the benzene rings. And instead of having that flexible hexane chain, we have rigid benzenes. So this is even stronger per weight than uh, um, steel. So, so weight to strength ratio, Kevlar is stronger than steel even. And it can, it's used in that capacity. Okay, so those are all polyamides. Those all have that hydrogen bonding making them some of the strongest intramolecular forces we have. Now let's move on to the next one. And we already introduced this one, uh, polyethylene terephthalate. And polyethylene terephthalate is typically made by a transesterification reaction, okay? Because making the acid chloride and reacting with alcohol produces a bunch of acid, and that's not very good. And making, trying to do it with just heating with water to remove water actually takes a bit of a catalyst. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a transesterification. Typically, it's a little bit of acid, and so typically you have a very small, low boiling alcohol, and then we have a diol. In this case, we have this. This boils at like 180 degrees. This boils here at 56 degrees, okay? So by taking the methyl, and this boils at like 220, by taking those materials and just melting them together, with a drop of acid catalyst, you can have it take out methanol in the transesterification, and that drives the reaction to completion. By having this methanol leaving as a gas, you can drive the polymerization to make these very high molecular weight systems. Okay, so how do we make the starting materials for that? Well, industrially, we make the diol by taking ethylene gas and oxidizing it to make an epoxy, ethylene oxide. And then all you need to do is add a little water and acid and it opens up to give us a diol. Remember those epoxies open with any nucleophile attacking them to give us a one, two diol. Now we make the terephthalic acid by oxidizing the side groups of our benzene derivative. We can use O2, we can use a bunch of different chromic acids and it gives us our dicarboxylic acid. So again, used from petrochemical streams, we can make these very, very uh, in very large industrial reactions.
All right, so that was an ester, and that's the primary ester. There's a lot of derivatives like Dacron or whatever. But the next thing I wanna talk about is polycarbonate. Now, this is a functional group we really haven't talked about. But a polycarbonate is basically having an ester on both sides of the carbonyl. So let me show you that first, okay? So it's almost like right here is the group right here. So we have an O double bond, uh, a carbonyl with two oxygens on it. Now that might look a lot like this right here. Okay, that's carbonic acid. But remember, carbonic acid decomposes into CO2 in the water. But by taking away those hydrogens and putting carbons here, it actually makes it a nice stable compound. We call that diester a carbonate, polycarbonate. And most of the time we make that with what we call bisphenol A, which is this one right here. And by taking that with a gaseous component called phosgene, it can react to form polycarbonate. Now you may have heard of polycarbonate if you wear glasses, the polycarbonate lenses are the ones that are lighter. Also, all of your safety glasses that say a Z97, a Z87, are polycarbonate because they are impact resistant, crystal clear, and are chemically resistant. So polycarbonates are used extensively for transparent plastic windows, safety glasses, and eyeglasses. Okay, and so here's a trade name for it. It's called Lexan. These are used in, um, because of their high impact strength and their high, uh, tensile strength, which means pulling strength. They can be used for helmets. They can be used for uh, masks. They can also be used for, you know, hard to damage windows. We used to call them bulletproof windows, but you can always make a bigger bullet. So you can all, we don't call them that anymore, but we call them unbreakable uh, windows or safety windows or hard to break windows. Those can have this polymer, this clear polymer on either side, both sides, or maybe not, or have just one layer to be able to give us this tough, impact-resistant, clear wall. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> All right, the next unit we want to talk about, it's also a weird functional group. It's kind of like an ester, but it's kind of like an amide. okay? And if you look at one half of the, the group here, this side looks like an amide. But then if you looked at the other side, this side here looks like an ester. So we call that a carbamate. And the, the engineering term for that is polyurethane. You'll know this is a polyurethane foam or polyurethane elastomers. These are you know, used in a lot of different uh, uh, upholstery. And sometimes they're the, if you open up a package and it looks like they made foam around your object, that's typically a polyurethane foam used for the packing material. And it's got a really cool reaction because this is the only stepwise step growth polymer we use that does not produce a small molecule. Notice in that uh, polyamides, we made water and in the, the polycarbonates, uh, it was giving off uh, HCl in the esters, it was giving off ethanol. This is one of the few that we had that does not give off a small molecule. So how do we make that? Well, they're pretty easy to make. You make a, an isocyanate, typically a diisocyanate. If you look at that, that has a double bond that really, really wants to react. And we have it attacked by a nucleophile onto that carbonyl carbon, and that opens it up, transfers the hydrogen to the amine to give you your urethane. So that means you can change the properties by changing the spacing between the alcohol and the isocyanate to make them rigid, flexible, or even rubbery if you want them to be. Okay, so one of the common ones that we use is what we call toluene isocyanate right here. Okay, and notice we have an isocyanate here, an isocyanate here, and then our toluene group in the middle here. Then we can take any polymer with at least two OHs on it and react it together and give you this depending on how long this chain is here, it'll be really flexible or stretchy and stuff like that. And so you can make fibers out of this, you can make thin sheets out of this. It's commonly known as spandex or lycra, is the fabrics that we can get out of this. 
the last thing I want to talk to you about is our first thermoset. Okay, all of the other ones uh, can be, oh no, our, our polyurethanes and our epoxies are both what we call thermosets. Once they're made, they're made. It's hard to uh, use them again. The second one I want to talk about is the epoxy resin. The epoxy resin is known mostly as an adhesive, but you can also use it as a casting material. Like you may have seen a lot of uh, things on the internet where people have these really cool clear epoxy eggs that look like they have flames on them. A lot of those are epoxy resins that are used in that. Okay. So, but what you do is you have your epoxy resin and then you add something like a, an alcohol to it and that alcohol will bring open the resin and make it uh, polymerize. Okay. Most of the time when we have an epoxy resin, we have more than one epoxy on that resin. And most of the time when we have the other component, we have more than one alcohol. What that means is that we have a cross-linked polymer or a ladder polymer that can never be dissolved after it's made. So the cool thing about how to make them is we just use our epoxy here. And it turns out we can use this as a nucleophile to displace the chloride first. And then that gives us our epoxy that can then be attacked by another nucleophile to make the chain. So when we attack it with another nucleophile, uh, really common in our adhesives is to have an amine because it's a very active nucleophile and it happens at room temperature, okay? And the nucleophile will come in and attack that to creating an alcohol and our long chain amine. So if you've ever had two-part epoxy, there's one that's slightly clearer and there's one that's a little more yellow. And when you squeeze it out, one smells really bad. That's the amine portion of the epoxy. The amine portion here tends to smell pretty badly. The epoxy side actually tends to not have that much of an odor. So if you ever mix those two parts together and they have that stinky smell, that's the amine component of your epoxy. All right, questions on step growth polymers. We're looking at those really common functional groups and having hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole bonding enhances their strength. All right, let's move on to the second type. So in that first type, we were making functional groups we normally see like amides and esters and stuff like that. In step growth and chain growth, we don't do that. In chain growth, we use what we call a radical mechanism most of the time. And in all of the systems I'm gonna show you, we're gonna have a double bond turn into a new sigma bond. And so we're eliminating a lot of the double bonds out of the system that's the part that the, those are the electrons making the connection with the other monomer to have it grow and grow and grow. And we call these chain growth polymers because they're almost uh, exclusively react with alkenes to create an unsaturated polymer at the end. So how do you do that? If you don't have a functional group, we're doing a carbon-carbon bond. Gosh, there's gotta be a special way to do that. Well, there is, but let's talk about some of the monomers that can be used. In fact, we can use almost anything with a double bond in it and make a polymer out of it. So if we look at this first one right here, this is ethylene. It's just two carbons and four hydrogens, and we can make polyethylene out of that. And this polyethylene, also known as visqueen, if you're from England, uh, is brake resistant containers, the plastic bags. Uh, they can make uh, big, Outsides of coolers are a lot of times made out of polyethylene because it's real durable and chemical resistant. Um, if you add a carbon here, we get polypropylene. That changes its properties just enough that it makes a really good fiber or really good textile. It also makes some of the transparent packaging that is really good because it has a low crystallinity. We talked about our vinyl chloride here, which can make tubing or rubber tubing or construction tubing. If we have two chlorines on there, that changes it again. We call that uh, <coughs> vinylene. <coughs> and so when we have a copolymer of the dichloro and the vinyl chloride, we get saran wrap. 
having that one extra chlorine in there changes its elasticity and you can actually stretch it and pull it in multiple directions. So having those two different components in there makes it have a certain property. Let's go switch over to a nitrile group, a C triple bond N. This is really good for things like um, uh, acrylics. Uh, they're, they're known as acrylics or methacrylics. They typically are very good bonders and make very strong fibers. Let's take all the hydrogens away. Turn it into tetrafluoroethylene. Huh, tetrafluoroethylene. Polytetrafluoroethylene or Teflon is a nonstick coating. The fluorines don't allow anything to bond to it. So if just by taking it, all the hydrogens away, you can make something that is nonstick. Let's add a benzene ring. That gives it styrene. That gives you insulating materials. Let's put an ester on there. But again, we're still gonna polymerize here so that ester stays intact during the entire thing. That's used in a lot of paints. Uh, they're used in paints as well as um, also casting resins as well. And methyl methacrylate is that cool smell. Uh, it's used a lot as a, um, a glue and it's used in what we call plexiglass or lucite. It's a, it's a very impact resistant material. Not the same as uh, the one we use for safety glasses, polycarbonate. It's, used, it's not as impact resistant as that but it still does make a very clear glassy substrate. Okay, so those are the different monomers we can use and how it changes the properties just by adding that little group on there. But how do we polymerize it? Well, we don't have any functional groups and we're only making a carbon-carbon bond. So we only have a couple ways to do that. One is by a nucleophilic, electrophilic thing. We don't have anything leaving. So we have to do it by a different um, mechanism. And this mechanism is what we call a radical chain growth mechanism, meaning we're taking one electron from one uh, uh, alkene on one molecule, and we're taking one electron from the one alkene on the other molecule, taking those and putting them together to create a new carbon-carbon bond, okay? So there's a really interesting process associated with this. It's not like any of the other chemistry we've done so far. And so, to have this radical uh, chemistry, we actually have three steps in the system. We have the creation of a radical. Every time a radical reacts with another uh, alkene, it creates another radical. So that's what we call propagation. So we make it, then it reacts with a monomer, and each time it reacts with a monomer, it makes another radical. So the reaction just keeps going and going and going until you run out of things to react with then you terminate it or you stop the reaction, okay? So let's go into each of those steps in detail, okay? The first thing we do is we want to figure out how we create a radical. Most of the times to create a radical, we use a weak bond between two oxygens because both of those oxygens have the same electronegativity, right? So, neither oxygen is gonna take both electrons away to make an anion and leave a cation behind. So to be fair, they each break apart and they each take one electron with them. Okay. Whenever we talk about taking just one electron, we only have a single barb on our arrows. That tells us we have one electron, okay? Remember all of our other arrows when we were doing nucleophilic attack had two prongs. We were moving these electrons. Both of those sides, one was, each of those was an electron. So when we're moving one electron, we have this fish hook arrow, and that's a new terminology for us. So if we do that in this position here, we end up with our two radicals to start with. So now we've generated our first radical. So we've initiated our reaction. So what happens next? Well, the next thing that happens is we have to propagate our chain, meaning our initiator, our radical we just formed, has to react with something with a double bond on it. And whenever it reacts with something with a double bond on it, it has to create another radical, okay? So our first step is making that radical. The second step is having that radical 
be on a chain. And then it just keeps going and going and going until you run out of things to react with. So what does that look like? So I said we had a radical here and we're gonna use one electron of the alkene to create the new sigma bond, this new sigma bond right here. But the other radical, the other uh, electron of that double bond stays on the chain. Okay, so, well, what do I do now? Well, I take that radical and react with another alkene, creating a new sigma bond, but it generated a radical again. Well, let's react with more, and it generated a radical again. And that's gonna keep going until you run out of alkene. <coughs> so this is what we call the chain propagation step and why it just keeps going and going and going. Because every time a radical reacts with the alkene, it generates one more radical, okay? So we gotta stop this somehow. At the end of the reaction, we're gonna run out of uh, alkenes. So what happens? Well, the last step is when you are ran out of alkenes and so finally an, a radical finds another radical and terminates the reaction, giving you your neutral polymer and the reaction is done, okay? So we have three steps in this chain growth. We have to initiate a radical. We have to use that radical to react with alkenes. Each time they do, they generate another radical until we run out of alkenes. And then we have step three chain termination, okay? So these things can go very fast. They can go so fast and produce so much heat they can run out of control. So we have to be very careful when we do these reactions. Add just enough initiator so that it reacts to give us our trend. Time-wise, all right, yeah, good. Okay, so the radical reaction with double bonds almost always gives the more stable radical. So Radicals run stability just like carbocations. So the tertiary radical is typically more stable than the secondary radical, which is more stable than the primary. But that also works with the idea that a vinylic carbocation is more stable than a tertiary carbocation, and a benzylic carbocation is more stable than a vinylic. So. That tells us why we're using things like um, uh, uh, styrene reacts so well in the system because it actually has a very stable radical, okay? So that stability, that idea that the radical is gonna form on the more substituted side leads to a really cool concept in the fact that your polymer is regioregular. You always have head to tail lengths on it. So notice this is our number, this is our number one carbon and this is our number two carbon. And between number one and number two, the most stable radical is gonna be the one on number two is gonna give us the most stable radical here. So whenever we react with something over here, it's gonna react on the one side first and it's gonna give a secondary radical. That secondary radical is going to then react with the number one position of another molecule generating our new sigma bond, and it's gonna continue on and on and on and on and on. So that means all the substituents, no matter what they are, are all gonna be equally spaced all the way down the chain because it follows this head to tail linkage. That's where one always, you know, the radical always react with the least stable one first, generating the more stable one, and that more stable one is gonna react with the least stable one more, and then just keep going, go, go. So that's why it is what we call a regio-regular step growth, I mean, ch radical chain growth polymer. Okay, uh, questions on those three steps on chain growth. Okay, it's different than anything we've done so far, and it's a little bit weird, but you can see how just, you know, once you start that radical there, you know which side it's gonna react on first. You know that when you react it there, you're gonna generate another radical. That radical is gonna to react with another alkene in exactly the same way, generate another radical and just keep going and going and going until we terminate. All right, so 
one of the most common for this is what we call the polyethylenes. And so if you think about it, you have ethylene is a very small molecule. And so when you zip it up, it makes it's number one, very inexpensive, and it makes this tough polymer system. Now, just let, let's talk about just alkanes in particular at first right here. So if we had just hexane, that's a liquid. And then we had dodecane, that's a liquid. And then we added that to 20 carbons long, that becomes a wax, okay? And they have really low boiling points compared to other functional groups because all they have is van der Waals forces, okay? So now if you go to 20 and it's a wax, you have to go to hundreds of thousands to get them to be the tough polymer system. Because again, it's weak interactions with the system, okay? Now, within polyethylene, by adding different amounts of al different kinds of alkenes, you can cause what we call branching. Okay, remember that uh, structure of branched polymers there? This happens a lot in polyethylene. Now, if we have a lot of impurities that create these branches, <clears throat> we call this low density polyethylene because it has so many of these branches and chain transfers that it makes it very, <coughs> it doesn't pack very well because you have all these uh, branches going in all these different directions and therefore it's largely amorphous and it's largely transparent. Okay. So most of the low density polyethylene is typically made into films. So things that are, you know, for packaging films or if you get it really thick, it starts to get a little bit of texture to it. But <coughs> so when we think of low density polyethylene, we think of lots of branches, lots of interlacing polymer chains. So one of the ways we can process that because number one, it has a melting point and number two, we can take it below its TG. <coughs> so it'll be kind of rubbery, but we can mold it once it's in that process. And so the way we make plastic bags or the way we make plastic sheet goods is we actually take a, uh, some of the polymer right here and we melt it ahead of time. And then we slowly push it through a little die. And when we slowly push it through a die, what it does is it squeezes it out into a tube, okay? And while you're squeezing it out into a tube, you blow air into it. So if you squeeze the top of the tube, it'd blow up like a balloon. And then at the top, you let it, it's cooled down so much by the time it gets to the top that it no longer sticks to itself. And then it kind of folds over on itself. You, uh, and then it makes this huge, basically tube of polyethylene that all they have to do is, you know, add a slice to the side of it and it turns into polyethylene sheet. Okay. So this is an interesting thing. We can't do this with small molecules. We can only do this with polymers because they have that property of that glass transition state, going from a glassy state to a rubbery state, and then back to that glassy state. And we use that in our advantage to make these films, okay? <clears throat> so how do we do this? Well, you can either use an impurity that has a longer chain on it, or you can use what we call a chain transfer agent. What a chain transfer agent does is it actually takes the growing uh, radical <coughs> and substitutes it somewhere in the middle of that polymer chain. And so it's sometimes called backbiting, okay? And this typically happens when you can form a four or five membered ring. And if we blow up this top here, uh, six or uh, six, five or six membered rings, all right? Let's say we have our polymer growing on here and now we have, because it's ethylene, we only have the choice of the primary radical, and that primary radical is not that stable, right? It would rather be a secondary or tertiary. So what can happen is that we can have this radical abstract the hydrogen and move it over here, and that gives us a secondary radical. So our driving force for this chain transfer agent or this bike bedding is the idea we're making a more stable radical. When we make that more stable radical, well, now our radical is in the middle of the chain and that's where it starts growing off of, right? So actually it's going off of this way. This is that small little chain. Notice there's four car, one, two, three, four carbons in that chain because it made a, a six-member transition state. 
and move one hydrogen over. So we have that little teeny short chain. Okay. And the whole point, the whole reason it does it is because the secondary radical is more stable than the primary radical. Okay. Now, what if you don't want this? What if you don't want this and you want to be have it grow perfectly and not have this backbiting? Well, we can change the mechanism a little bit. Okay. And we go with a different catalyst system. In this catalyst system, it's called the ziegler nada catalyst system. What we're gonna do is instead of growing with just an unprotected radical, we're actually going to have a specific interaction happening right at the surface of a support. And we're gonna insert things into between the support, which is a solid, and the growing off polymer chain, okay? So we call this a heterogeneous catalyst because it's like when we do that heterogeneous uh, hydrogenation, we have some kind of solid in there, that, that metal uh, that, that doesn't dissolve anything that acts as the surface. We do that exact same thing with the ziegler nada catalyst. And usually the, the support is something ceramic like uh, magnesium, but the active ingredient is what we call tickle chloride or titanium tetrachloride and some kind of aluminum compound with a aluminum carbon bond. Okay. That aluminum carbon bond is a very polar bond and we can use that to our advantage. Okay, so what does that look like? So the first thing we do is we take our substrate, our magnesium chloride, and we re react the, the titanium tetrachloride to it. And the titanium sticks to that surface and has that reactive titanium chlorine bond. Okay, so now, in this case, our chlorine can act as a Lewis base because it has those three lone pairs and react with the aluminum, which acts as a Lewis acid because it's, uh, it's electron deficient. And when it does so, it exchanges a chlorine for one of its ethyl groups. And therefore we get an ethyl group on the end. And this aluminum has two chlorines on it and only one ethyl group, okay? So we've done an insertion of a carbon where a chlorine was, and now we have that titanium carbon bond, okay? That titanium carbon bond is still polar, okay? It can still act as a Lewis acid. So we have an electrophile in the ethylene. That lone pair acts as an electrophile and inserts itself into this bond. So notice how we're perfectly growing. We've started the end tab here and we're inserting two carbons, two carbons, two carbons, two carbons, two carbons. And we didn't form a radical. We're looking at this polar bond to make the reaction happen stepwise, but we're still reacting it with an alkene to give us that growth, uh, that uh, chain growth polymerization. Notice the chain is growing each time now, because there's no backbiting, there's fewer, there's less branches in high density polyethylene than low density polyethylene. What that means is we have fewer chains that are, can't stack together. We have most of the chains are all aligned and can be, have a higher crystallinity because we have straighter chains. And if we have higher degree of crystallinity in straighter chains, that makes it stronger because we have more van der Waals forces giving it strength. And it's harder to melt because we have more van der Waals forces giving it strength. So that means that we typically use a um, fabrication technique where we try to extend that by pulling it. The more you pull it, the stronger it gets. In fact, there's a product out there made out of polyethylene that when it's pulled just right, it's as strong as Kevlar because the chains perfectly align to give you that van der Waals, van der Waals interaction, and there's no gaps between the chains. And that's called spectrofiber, and it's also used in uh, bulletproof vests. Okay, so we have to process it a little bit differently. We can't make that balloon thing. So what we do is we do a different process called flow molding. It's similar in the fact that we have a mold and we have some kind of a polymer tube that we heat up. And you put the polymer heated up polymer into 
the mold, you close the mold, and then you blow high pressure air to make it stick to the sides. Now, when it hits the sides, the mold is colder or is below that glass transition temperature. If it's below that glass transition temperature, that means it freezes in space and it, re it regains its rigidity. And when you open the mold, it's popped out as your final product. The cycle time, the opening and closing times can be as little as 30 seconds. Sometimes it's as long as a minute. But uh, go online and look at how it's made, uh, like plastic bottles, it's really cool videos. But it all relies on that concept of heating it above its glass transition temperature and then cooling it down below its glass transition temperature after you've done your mold. All right, plenty of time. All right. So on many different plastic compounds, you might have seen the plastic recycling code 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. So here's how they relate to that. So uh, number one is called PET or PETE, -E, has the extra E at the end, and that's polyethylene terephthalate. So a lot of anything transparent typically is PET, anything chemical resistant, it tends to be PET and a lot of uh, uh, tough films and fibers. Uh, for example, have you ever seen those balloons that have a metallic look to them, okay? So that metallic look actually comes from the idea that we have PET that's been stretched in two directions, and then they apply a thin layer of aluminum metal on there. That aluminum metal stops the gas from permeating, and so it can hold helium much, much longer than the vinyl balloons. And that film is made from PET and by stretching it, it makes it very tough and very durable. So that's recycling code number one. Recycling code number two is a high density polyethylene. And these tend to be the more opaque, blow molded kind of things. Uh, a lot of big tubs are also done that. Uh, a lot of food troughs for horses are made from uh, high density polyethylene because it's pretty tough. Uh, and it resists sunlight quite well. The third zone is the PVC. It's not just B, it's P. Well, it's actually labeled B for vinyl chloride. Um, these again are things that tend to be chemically resistant, <coughs> uh, things that uh, need to be bleached. Uh, polyvinyl chloride is very uh, stable to things that are bleached. So things that are in your kitchen, where you want to bleach them or shower curtains and stuff like that. It's also used on a lot of um, wires as coatings because it kind of self extinguishes so that it doesn't allow a lot of burning in our in the system. And it's also used in uh, the wear resistant floor tiles and credit cards. Most of the time when you recycle PVC, you turn it into a rubberized material by adding a plasticizer and it turns into floor mats or the flexible floor mats. Recycling code four is low density polyethylene. And that's mainly uh, shrink wrap and, and small bags. It's really hard to recycle film like that because it tends to gum up in the machines. But when they do recycle it, it's typically done at an industrial process. You can make plastic bags or grocery bags out of that. <coughs> I think it was some uh, number I saw a couple of years ago was about 87% of the plastic in plastic bags is actually recycled from other sources. Hang on. All right, um, number five is polypropylene. These are those clamshell packaging. That happens a lot, those are really hard to get into. <coughs> it's also used in bottle caps, toys, um, and not the actual part that absorbs water in diapers, but the outside portion that prevents water from transferring. And they can be uh, done what we call mixed plastic components, which is um, <coughs> typically lower value things. Anything you see like a big pallet that has all these kind of stringy fibers in it, that tends to be the recycled polypropylene because it's hard to remelt it back and get the right color out of it. Uh, number six is polystyrene. Uh, any, almost all the foam you see, all the packaging foam, uh, anything that when you break it apart has a uh, kind of a chemical order to it, that tends to be polystyrene. And that can be recycled into a bunch of different things. 
specifically things that, you know, uh, polystyrene's, if it's not foamy, it tends to be fairly easy to break and brittle. So you can tell the difference between some of them. And then seven is everything else. And basically uh, <clears throat> that tracks lumber that you use for stuff. It's mostly polyethylene, but then everything else is kind of thrown in with it. There's no specific uh, <coughs> uh, use for that because the different polymers might not mesh together really well in the melting. So we have a different code for that. Okay, questions about the recycling codes or polymers in general? <coughs> oh. uh, for those of you following, I'm going in for my first allergy shot today. So got my EpiPen and everything. So. Okay, that is all I wanted to talk about with the polymer chemistry. Again, the idea that you can go into the lab, take two uh, little you know, liquids, put them together and turn it into a material that you can melt and stretch and pull and you know, change colors. I, I just, that's really exciting for me. All right. Well, um, so uh, we have no scheduled class for Wednesday um, because they usually let us out at noon on Wednesday. So, but our review will be on that Monday, the 30th. Okay. So don't miss the review. All right, any questions? I'll, I'll go ahead and stop recording so you can ask off camera.